we can kick this off. Uh, and again, I want to welcome uh, all of you that uh, are out there today for this special webinar, uh, sorting through our uh, forage supply options. Uh, we felt that uh, the situation was uh, severe enough for so many farms and people, uh, farms that many of you advise that we should uh, provide some extra information uh, uh, and extra webinar with Mike's thoughts on uh, feed supply strategy. So uh, this is a special webinar with that in mind uh, and um, the folks at Biotol were kind enough to sponsor this today. And uh, Mike, uh, we'll uh, turn it over to you and uh, let you take off from here. Well, very good, Steve. It's uh, a pleasure to, to join the group here. And I do want to add my thanks. Uh, uh, Steve and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and things are happening so fast that uh, by the time we get to October, some of the options that we want to talk about today just aren't going to be possible. And then we really want to talk the Lalaman, thank the Lalaman people and the Biotel people for, uh, for sponsoring because it allows it to really happen as far as that goes. Steve, it's exciting to me because I think this is a event that the webinar gives us the opportunity that if something is breaking quickly, uh, we have the ability to mobilize quick and get information out that uh, can't be done uh, very strategically other ways as far as that goes. So thanks to both uh, Horns yeah. and Biotel. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yep, I was no problem. Say, it is uh, wonderful that we have a, a good sized audience of people out there in, uh, you know, in our webinar database, so to speak, that we can uh, alert them to these special uh, uh, events as well as our scheduled ones. So we appreciate that. Now, sorry. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Mike. Well, Steve, we have up here, right, basically, uh, Jim Baltz put up uh, the, the latest uh, version on the U.S. drought monitoring situation, and you can look at it more than I can talk about it. We know the really dark brown areas are big trouble, and you can see some areas in the Midwest really in deep trouble here in the southern part of Illinois, parts of Indiana. The red isn't much better, so it's tough going. You can see the whole state of Illinois. You can see some of our colleagues uh, in, uh, in uh, eastern Pennsylvania and northern Minnesota certainly have a little better situation going, but certainly that's the whole impetus saying that this this has not changed a great deal. We look at range conditions and that's another factor we can look at. Jim found this number and you can see uh, you know that uh, very poor to very poor conditions. National average is 60 percent but look at states like Missouri you know 99 percent of the pasture and range conditions are poorly and so that impacts certainly all the feed sources as well. So what are we going to do? A little different kind of webinar today, uh, Steve. Uh, we're going to try to get done a bit early, and I want to get some feedback because I, I think we have some really uh, good ideas that can come from our listeners. I see who's on our program, and there's some real gunners out there, and we appreciate you uh, coming in. These are the things we're going to touch on uh, very quickly, and when it gets close to quarter to one, we are going to wrap up regardless of where we're at at this stage of the game. Well, well let's talk a little bit about drought, drought stress corn slide. It's happening right now. In fact, Illinois is about done. I'm not sure it's quite as bad as, as blowing uh, uh, money into the wagon, but you know, you, it could be blowing money into the wagon, as you'll see a bit later, or maybe blowing it over the top of the wagon. This is some of Jim Baltz's artistry as far as that goes. Let's do a quick poll. Uh, if many of you are on here, I want you to go ahead and, and vote. And it says, uh, with the drought corn situation that you're experiencing or you read about, what would be your main concern? And I listed five of them. <coughs> and we're going to go ahead and open up the uh, Open up the window here and uh, let some of you vote here. And uh, we're off and running. We usually give you about 30 seconds. Uh, <coughs> we should have a lot more Republicans voting because uh, the, obviously the convention has been delayed because of Isaac down there. So we should be okay. So uh, we're off and running. We got over half. So we got a quorum. That's always good at this stage of the game. Uh, Jim is going to be able to uh, show this to you here in, in just a minute. You know what there is, uh, Steve? No really right or wrong answer here. But these were all the questions that are coming in from, from us that we're seeing at this stage of the game. And we're at 70%. So uh, we're going to go ahead and show that. And Jim is showing that right now. You can see see that 23% uh, high nitrate uh, sugar content. I think we would be thinking about that one a little bit. Uh, the low starch is a big factor, low, low, low yields as well, and then of course uh, the higher NDF. These are all points we're going to cover very quickly in the next 15 minutes as far as that goes. So we're going to go to our next PowerPoint, thanks to our colleagues in Dairyland Labs. Uh, many labs have this information, but we thought, Steve, uh, let, let's see what's happening. So this, as you can see, fresh corn samples, uh, almost 1,400 samples, a nice data 
database here uh, July 1 through August 7th when Jim uh, pulled the trigger on it and here you can come across uh, this is a very busy slide we're not going to talk but you got uh, for you statisticians standard deviation mins and max so this crop is all over all over look at the first one I'm going to circle uh, the more uh, that corn that uh, people are going to bring in 75 percent moisture it's too wet Steve it's too wet we're going to have some challenges with uh, with EPA with runoff a lot of leachate loss of nutrients and 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 the fermentation profile from that aspect over here this is normal corn size listed above that was in the database uh, you come over you see the ADFs are a little bit higher the NDFs are higher as well so certainly not a big surprise for most of you at this stage of the game but look at this number here the NDF digestibility 30 hours 59 percent that's a really good number a really good number you can see some numbers down here that are, that are almost as high as some of the, the lower lignin corn sizes a typical number 55 to me would be a pretty good number uh, that wasn't here in the in the database we had but 55 I call it pretty good corn silage uh, you come over here look at the starch and of course a lot of you picked that number here you can see we're missing about a third of our starch look over here sugar a surprising number very high sugars you can look at look how high some of these sugars are now I think you want to look at that because that's going to have an impact on fermentation. may also have some impact on stability of the corn silage, especially when we look at some of our, our yeast products. More about that in just a few minutes. So it's a different crop, no question about it. So what's our take-home take message, Steve? Obviously, we're, we're, we're going to uh, test it. The next one, of course, is nitrates. And that was identified as a huge concern amongst your people as well. And uh, what you have here, you can see the different uh, the levels. And this is nitrate nitrogen. So some of you that do nitrates, this would be up around 16,000, 17,000. So be very careful because that's one of the things we're seeing. The labs are coming different directions, reporting this number back to our, our, our people. And so you can see us crooks in Illinois, 87% of our corn is safe. That is before we ensile it. And another, so you can see we have no dangerous corn in Illinois. Uh, they're elevated, but very, very, but now go to our colleagues in Nebraska, South Dakota. Holy smokers, just take, take, take a look at that. So you can see, yes, be concerned with that. And uh, as we mentioned in our earlier webinar a couple, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, I guess two months ago, was that, that fermentation is going to help us out a little bit on that. Now, some of you may want to look at this data a little bit clear, more carefully. And Jim put this together. Now you can see the counts. But you can see the South Dakota data, 300 samples, another uh, 340 samples coming from Iowa, Illinois, sitting with 200 samples. So a pretty, pretty good database to look at to say yes, yes, and there are risk but there are also some opportunities with this crop as well and again this is a table we thought Jim thought we should put in it simply shows you the relationship of nitrate nitrogen nitrates and those same action levels as far as that goes at this point now remember this is total ration dry matter so two things to remember you got total ration dry matter so some of these higher elevated corns you'll be uh, you'll be diluting that with haylage uh, with uh, cereal grains the protein supplements byproduct feeds and stuff like that as well and of course this has not been fermented so take home message here is Steve uh, again test for nitrates when it's coming out of the silo and of course remember if you're in a silo danger 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 these nitrogen gases can really be lethal and we we are telling our dairymen nobody goes in silo unless they've got oxygen supply uh, yeah we can run blowers we can blow stuff but you still got to come up and down shoots and that uh, no no go no go unless you got oxygen tanks uh, strapped on, on on your back as far as that goes a uh, dairy line also had some other uh, products there as well uh, some other forages and some small grain forages and you can see they got some elevated nitrates in them as well so certainly uh, the drought stress corn is a concern but certainly we should be aware of some of these other fe uh, feeds out there as well this weekend, Pioneer shared some information with us uh, looking at the relationship of nitrate uh, concentration to starch accumulation. And it simply says that in, uh, Steve, I guess you were commenting that you were in some fields that you couldn't even find, how they find any cobs. But you can see as the starch numbers increase, the nitrate numbers come down. This is based on some 90, 92, 93 samples that came in the last two weeks. So you can see if we have some corn out there, that does lower the nitrate risk. But of course, we're still going to check and test that one as well. And then another one they did is no big, well, I guess it's a surprise to me, but I guess it makes sense. You can see as the starch content goes up on these crops, then the sugar contents come down. So the corn plant basically is smart enough to say we're going to translate those sugars into starch if we've got the moisture and the, and the green material tissue to get that job done. So that's why you saw these, these uh, variable sugar content numbers out there as well.
Now, quick comment on the sugar. Certainly we know that if there is sugar in the corn sides after the fermentation has occurred, boy, the, the yeast cells love that stuff. They love that stuff. Uh, they will grow. So certainly that may have some impact on the type of inoculant that you're going to be wanting putting on your corn crops. I know some of us are done already here in Illinois, but there's still corn going to be chopped in northern Illinois uh, in certainly uh, areas as well. So certainly be aware of that one. And remember, those sugar contents should help us on the fermentation, uh, should really jumpstart our fermentation as being a fairly readable source of fermentable carbs to get a hopefully a, a decent fermentation in those uh, various storage structures we have on the farm. <coughs> we know also that there are some uh, different levels of nitrates. Most of us have seen this slide. We used it in July, but we thought we'd show it for some people who want to say, well, if I'm nervous, can I high chop? The answer is yes, you can high chop. But remember, for about every foot that you're going to leave out here, there's going to probably be at least a ton of dry matter. And many of my farms, as identified in the survey, are fighting a, a forage inventory supplies to get through to next year as far as that goes. Jim, let's go ahead and open up our poll. It says, okay, if, this, if the uh, corn uh, size is going to be low, and we're seeing reductions of at least uh, 40 to 60% in Illinois in these drought stress areas, and Steve, your, your three-foot corn size got hurt a lot more than, mm -hmm. than, than 30 or 40 or 50%, but you can see these are some other choices. So why don't you go ahead and vote, and you're saying, I work a dairyman or my farm. What am I going to explore? And you can vote on this. And they can vote multiple times. They, they can they can select a couple so oh my goodness this is like Illinois voting this is Illinois voting Jim <laughs> says you can vote more than once holy smokestacks I thought we I thought we stopped that uh, five years ago but then again our governor's in jail so how how are we how are we gonna go Steve tell us a little about the my, corn crop you were in uh, just uh, this weekend well I was <clears throat> just uh, could, could walk 10 12 feet and not find an ear at all on some of the stocks and uh, a lot of them were less than five inches long I had to really look to find one that was seven to eight inches long. Okay. And, and well, Jim, uh, let's uh, let's kind of look and see kind of what the vote is. We got uh, two thirds of you voted, so that's that's pretty good for Democrats or Republicans at this point. Uh, what are you going to look at? Uh, draw stress corn size. Uh, that is a uh, very popular answer. You can see a third of you voted for that. The big one, of course, is small fall small grain annuals, and that's why we want to do the webinar. There's a couple of these things we got to be were aware of right now. Two of them are going to be the the last two: uh, draw stress soybeans and uh, the uh, the fall small grains. And this is what really has preempted this webinar more than some of the other ones as far as that goes. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward on this if we can. Let's say a few words about small grain forage resources. Uh, at this stage of the game, we're, we're looking like at oat silage, uh, triticale, wheat, barley, rye silage, those kind of small grains coming into play. What are the key factors that you got to take a look at? First of all, you got to be aware if there's going to be any herbicide carryover. In other words, uh, if you've got some round up carry over I think you got a problem think you got a problem availability of seed uh, we discover now in Illinois oats is about gone there is no oat seed out there anymore and so you may have to look at some other uh, other uh, other small grain forages but the availability of the seed especially if you're looking for a short season uh, variety and that's exactly what we're gonna be looking for the whole question uh, you know dry seed in the ground doesn't do much so we got to have some moisture we got to have some rain now we got that in Illinois and so if some of my guys pull the trigger uh, seeing this rain coming here, uh, they're going to have the small grain forages up really fast because soil temperatures now are still at the 4-inch level over 80 degrees, 72 degrees at the 8-inch level. So the, 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 these small grains will leap out of the ground. And then, of course, the big question is, I've got to have uh, 60, 70 growing days here. Do you have enough time before we get a killing frost or uh, adequate growing period? So I think uh, th this is not just an automatic yes, but certainly things to consider out here. Uh, we went to the NRC to look at, uh, uh, and now remember, these are just NRC values, uh, so nothing to do with drought here. Uh, these are usually spring harvested forages, but you can see they all look alike. You can see the NDFs uh, in, in, in the high 50s, your ADFs, your lignans, uh, pretty typical type feed that you're going to take a look at here. So certainly you can look at alternate uh, uh, small grains if you're having trouble finding seed out in the farm. The real answer is to go to an early, early maturing uh, type uh, seed variety if we can, and that's where some of the oat cultivars came into play as far as that goes. Now, of course, uh, uh, the data we're going to show you is all from Wisconsin. We want to recognize that uh, uh, Dan Undersander and some of his people who put this information out uh, for us here, but uh, for, for them and us, the, 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 the forage type cultivars is too late. That had to go in, and now we're sitting in late August right now, and so again, uh, we're getting 
tight here. And so that's why for some of you, the, the window may have passed already if you're in certain parts of the United States. Other of you still have some time to take a look at this. This is all Wisconsin data, and we want to certainly recognize the, the source of this. Uh, some of this coming from the Forage uh, USDA Research Center here. Uh, this, you can see, they, these go by uh, by by uh, uh, cultivars. This will be your shortest one, Ogle, and then uh, Forage would be your latest one. So you can see what's happening here. These are planted in mid-August, so we're pretty close to that at this point. Uh, uh, Steve, we can take a look at that so you can see in September, this is our tonnage. And that's been one of the questions our farmers are asking, what kind of yield of dry matter can I expect? So obviously, if I only got a month's growing condition, you got yourself about a uh, about, about a half a ton of dry matter. You can see when I get to another month to October, numbers look really nice. And when I get to November, you can see this shorter variety, which means it's starting to elongate and go and, and, and develop, you can see, becomes the winner. So this is that short season variety. Now, for many of us in Illinois, we, we can't find it anymore at this point. I did have two dairymen said they're going to run, they're going to plant bin run oats. They'll clean it, mill it, and go bin run oats. So that's another alternative that you have out there is to use some exi existing seed as well. So again, answer the question about variety, or I should say cultivar, I should say is the right word to use here, and also growing days uh, a time at this stage. Now, if we get these, some of these warmer temperatures, this oats will grow pretty fast. It likes cool weather, actually. Uh, again, this uh, looks at the, uh, the, uh, the, N the NDF concentrations, again, we're looking at these different variety of cultivars. So you're looking at uh, this oats in general. You can see that, again, the short season one, we look at NDF, uh, this tends to be lower, where some of the other ones get to be higher. So be well aware there's going to be some differences when we look at cultivars and, and growing days out here. Here's another factor you're going to have to manage, and that is you can see that uh, in the first, uh, uh, again, this is that same oats that's pl planted in mid-August. You can see uh, in November, it's finally getting down to the point you could take a direct chop. So again, we want to wilt this down. Uh, the red line comes from my Wisconsin colleagues. I'd probably draw that line around 35% uh, dry matter, even 40 if I could. So you may have to wilt. You may have to wilt this crop down, and of course, uh, November, some parts of the United States, um, you better watch the, the weather forecast because you might have to watch uh, snow at that same stage of the game. But you can see, again, as this crop gets more mature, longer, then it does dry out, and you could take this direct chop uh, to eliminate that, that extra process as far as that goes. Boy, this thing, in my view, is screaming for inoculant. Just screaming for inoculant, because when you get in these colder seasons, the natural bacteria load is going to be lower, and certainly you want to make sure we get a good fermentation started because, again, the temperature of the feed is going to be lower than, say, we're chopping it in July or, or May, depending on the growing season. Again, some Wisconsin data looking at uh, two different crops. Here we got oats and, and wheat uh, comparisons. Uh, these, these are uh, winter wheat uh, listed up here, and the other ones are the, uh, are the same ones we had for, um, for um, we, we saw earlier. So again, you can see in this comparison in Wisconsin, the oat variety uh, is certainly is a uh, crop variety is, is doing better than wheat, but certainly you still got your, your ton of dry matter with winter wheat. You want to remember that because that's going to be another alternative would be to plant a winter wheat and harvest it in the fall. And we'll touch on that briefly. We just don't have a lot of data. And the data Jim found for me was pretty much rye silage at this point. So Steve, what's the take home messages on, on this part of the webinar? It says, uh, uh, basically, uh, th two and a half to three bushel uh, seeding rate is, is a pretty good rate. This is primarily for oats. Oats are being a lighter bushel weight, 32 pounds. You probably wouldn't have to plant quite as many bushel with the, the higher barley and wheat uh, weight uh, product at this point. Uh, planting, uh, we got to plant now. I to tell you, we're, we're, we're late now uh, at this point, and we're still in August, so uh, we, we want to roll as far as that goes. If you're in Illinois, you got to be careful with the Hessian uh, the, uh, fly. Uh, that that affects wheat, and you got to be careful with that, uh, and that's usually mid-September, so be aware there may be some other management restrictions that you have to take a look at uh, other than just what we're talking about growing degree days. Harvest in the boot stage, that's pretty much where this crop is. The good news is in the cooler weather, it will not be pushed hard to, to, to ripen, so that, that will work to our favor a little bit in October and probably in November. We saw the yields out there, two to three tons of dry matter per acre, a really neat opportunity. Also, a neat place to stick manure, these small grain forage 
just love the nitrate, uh, the nitrogen that you be putting on manure along with the nutrients that come with it. We already covered the wilting and we already talked about the inoculant. So that's kind of the crib notes, as we'd say, on uh, the, the fall forages. I think our dairymen are going to like that in Illinois and maybe a lessons learned that we may see more of these fall crops coming in because those crooks down in, um, uh, down in Florida we were visiting last week, they're taking three crops a year off of an acre of land. And boy, that's a competitive advantage uh, for, for those dairy farms. And certainly we could be taking at least two, if not three as well, depending on what we want to go with. Mike, before yes. you move on, uh, it, is there a place for any sort of a sorghum to be planted, or sorghum sedan type uh, crop to be planted uh, for fall forage? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, looking back at the research and talking, uh, uh, visiting, uh, seeing, reading some of on Sanders, sorghums and sedan grass love hot weather. So that was a great decision in June. They would love. So if this was a June co uh, seminar and we knew the corn crop was going to get hammered as bad as it did in July, we could have planted it in June and July, taking a cutting every uh, 28 to 30 days, again, depending on moisture, it would be a good choice. With the cool weather coming, and of course, if you're now down southern part of the United States, you may still may be able to pull that trigger, Steve. But boy, here in Illinois, we're telling our guys uh, the, the game now here in August is going to be the the, the, the small grain. Mm -hmm. Great question, great question. And again, if some of you have experience, d jump in on this. Uh, we got a nice, uh, nice crowd here, Steve. And again, uh, start typing this stuff in, and we will read these comments. You don't have to ask a question; just tell us what you're seeing and what you're doing. So if someone disagrees with my answers, uh, trust me, uh, jump in and say, Mike, you're wrong. You can plant uh, sudac sorghum uh, feed uh, at this time. We okay, do have let's a in, uh, in this neighborhood up here that uh, has some some sedan type or uh, uh, sorghum. Looks to me like it's probably 18 inches tall at this point. So you know he's headed in there. Yeah. And, yep. Uh, so. Yep. Yep, so he might be okay. We, he, he might be able to get And we typically expect about a ton to ton and a half dry matter. We're, we're chopping at 30 inches for my dairy cows. Now, if you, got, you want dry cow feed, then you can let that go up to 40, 45 inches. You'll get some tonnage, but you're heading towards straw again. So, again, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Steve, uh, um, we usually say over 20 inches, you, run, you remove some of the risks you may have with oppressive acids, nitrates, and some of those kind of risks. So, if you're in that 30-inch level, and, of course, uh, today, now, if you had, if you had to put uh, sorghum sedan grass uh, in, in Illinois, uh, planted two or three weeks ago, uh, last night uh, it was 80 degrees at, at 10 o'clock at night with an inch of rain, uh, that, that stuff would be just screaming, uh, it should, screaming. It right up, wouldn't it? It'd, it'd be coming, coming fast. Well, let's uh, switch gears again. Time-wise, we're right on schedule. Uh, drought stress soybeans. Not many people are excited about that. I'm excited about it because, again, uh, in some cases, we don't know how bad, how hurt the soybeans are. The good news, these soybeans will flower over a much longer period. My guys are telling me they're dropping pods and they don't have the pod count out there. So let's talk about that. Well, here we go again. There's two biggies. Number one, of course, the draw stress corn will have that same one uh, with, with insurance. But number one, be well aware of herbicide and insecticide restrictions. Some of these have 15 days. Some have 30 day with uh, with uh, time. So eyes wide open because uh, if, if you end up harvesting this and you end up got a residue in your milk, you are in big trouble, guys and gals. Big big trouble. So be wide, be keenly keenly uh, keenly aware of that one as 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 well. Then of course check with your, your crop insurance agent to be sure you're allowed to take it as, as a forage crop uh, and be sure you have that done. Uh, th this is normal data. We got it from Wisconsin and North Carolina. Uh, these would be the various stages of maturity. If you're really going to go for uh, quality and quantity, then the pod development stage uh, is really the R3, R4 stage where you're going to be. Uh, the discussion for today is we may not have any seed there at all or we may not get to these pods or, uh, at this stage of the game. Uh, this data again coming uh, from uh, the uh, from the soybean loss uh, reference, and Jim Baltz has put a lot of references there that you can go to. At this point, you can kind of see the timeline when these pods start to fail and how fast we're going to move down here. Of course, that all depends 
again on uh, on on the the presence of pods and the moisture moisture condition. Uh, the next one looks at quality, and again, you can see uh, the tonnage and, and, and quality. Now, these will be normal soybeans. These are not drought-stressed soybeans. Our soybeans look pretty good here in Illinois, at least where we are. They're still green, and so the jury is now out on these at this point. But you can see one and a half, two tons of dry matter per acre. You can kind of anticipate the protein content looks just like alfalfa haylage, and uh, you can kind of see how this is changing and going with it at this stage of the game. So again, you're going to harvest this pretty much like you would any legume forage, alfalfa, clover, and products like that. Uh, if you're going to make silage out of it, uh, here we go. Uh, there's that R3, R4 stage. Uh, at this point, uh, again, uh, Don Understander's recommendation directly from him. We'd wilt this down, depending if you're in a pile, in a bag, or an upright. Make a little difference on dry matter. You can control that. You must cut the crop before the leaves drop. Boy, once you start seeing leaf drop, you are a day late and a dollar short. So uh, you really got to watch the leaves because they are they are by far the most uh, high or highest source nutrient here because of the pod that the seed and these draw stress ones aren't going to be a player we think uh, the theoretical length of chop three eighths half inch theoretical chop you're going to chop it just like you do Haley to this point again inoculant you'd be using an alfalfa legume type inoculant uh, product here depending on the products you're using on your farm at this point and the yields uh, we are expecting in a drought year somewhere around one or two tons of dry matter per, per acre the hay doesn't change very much other than boy you can't move it uh, I, I, I'm just nervous if you're going to bale hay because if you're going to have to turn it to try to get the moisture out of it, you're going to have leaf shatter like you won't believe. It's going to dry very slowly at this point. Probably some of that deuce has is related to uh, the, the condition. I think uh, we're going to have 90 degrees here today. I think she'd dry pretty fast on 90 degree days as far as that goes. But boy, if you're going to have to rake it or, or uh, merge it to try to get, to get your big choppers in there, I'm nervous, I'm nervous, I'm nervous at this point. Here comes the big economics. I've seen two different numbers out there looking looking to our agronomists, uh, our crop people at this point. This is the Hutchins uh, backing into the answer. If I'm assume I'm going to have a ton and a half of dry matter per acre, and I, f I got that valued, and that is what Spartan, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, Sesame and uh, Feed Val are telling me. It would be worth about $200 per ton. So maybe I've got $300 per ton of feed value out there. Uh, I'm assuming rolled into that is my harvesting charges. So I, I, to make my life simple, I'm not going to uh, back and get, get, get uh, heavy duty there. Then if I say I've got, so I've got the equivalent of $300 per acre. And if I have beans at $15 a bushel, Jim, I think that's low now. I think we're in the 16 plus range right now. Let's make it simple though, because you can see the answer. If $15 per bushel, it says if I got something less than $20 per bushel, remember I got harvesting costs on the, on the combine side of the, of the equation as well, then we, we may have a problem. So uh, at some point you're going to say, should I take it for seed? Now I saw a news release came out of Missouri said uh, 10 bushels. So if you got more than 10 bushel, you should combine it. If you got less than 10, I saw another one said five. So I won't get into that discussion, but this is how I, I looked it out. And you have those questions on, on, uh, on harvesting charges and tonnage that you're going to have to work off of as well. And we'll watch the leaves, watch the leaves, watch the leaves, as we'd say. So here's your take home messages that you want to take a look at. Jim just Googled it he said on the market today seventeen dollars and thirty cents so now you can see uh, ten dollar uh, ten bushels of beans uh, could look better or fifteen but away you go uh, I'm not going to give you a lot of right answers here I'm just going to simply say what are what are some of the possibilities again here are your take home messages and again Steve will will stop see if you have a comment uh, at this point we have no enough comments coming in from the field at this point but that uh, big Illinois orange is be careful be careful be careful Steve any comments no, it's just uh, uh, that I think uh, up here we're seeing a lot of leaf drop. Uh, you know, the crop is turning pretty well, so we're probably a little on the late up into this uh, in the soybean deal. Yeah. Now, what we're having here, Illinois, some double crop soybeans went in late, and they're green now, and this rain is going to help them. So, again, I just want to be sure our listeners are saying mm -hmm. that this, this is crops, uh, this is a moving target. The corn silage crop right. in Illinois is done. You, what you see is what you got. It's not going to change, even with these uh, inter rains we got the, this week and last week, as far as that goes. Right. Steve, th this one was just added, and, and that is because our plant pathologist, uh, Carl Bradley, said, uh, he called the meeting last Friday and said, uh, we're seeing aflatoxin in the six 
60 to 100 parts per million in this corn crop. And this corn crop is vulnerable because it's heat stressed and there's some ear rot sitting out there at this stage of the game. So Steve, I thought we would, we would talk about this one. Had we, had we uh, done this webinar a week ago, we might not have had it at this stage of the game. Here's the first one, and that is the levels for uh, action levels for various types of livestock. Uh, you can see uh, 20 parts per million, that's lactating cows. And that's because 1 or 2 percent of the aflatoxin is transferred or metabolites is transferred into the milk and they're situ a 0.5 parts per billion which is illegal to sell. In fact, talking with the Florida people, they've had several tankers dumped the last couple weeks now in Florida because of aflatoxin, but they always deal with aflatoxin. The good news is you can see that before it starts buggering up, my, my breeding stock uh, up to 100 parts per billion. Our major co-op right now is checking. And so they're telling you if their milk starts getting up around 0.3 parts per uh, billion, they're going to tell you and you have to take some, you should take some action on it before we start getting some of these other problems as well. So uh, that's the kind of the good news, bad news story with aflatoxin in milk at this point. Eyes wide open at this point. Uh, here are the other microtoxins out there. We think aflatoxin, it's in orange, bright orange. We think that's going to be the smoking gun this year. Uh, these are your other toxins, your DONs, your T2s, your xerolinones. Uh We just put those numbers up there for what, the, what they're worth. What are signs of microtoxin uh, toxicities? Uh, here they are. You have some reproductive challenges. You've got some immune suppression that's going to go on. You can have some uh, fecal uh, effects as well at this point. I don't think you'll see these. Uh, with the low levels that end up in the milk. Now, maybe somebody here wants to jump in and, 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 and kibitz on the side on that, but, uh, but the milk thing is, is strictly FDA, and, and to me that is, um, that is useful because hopefully we would never see this in my dairy cows because uh, you, you'd be off the market with the milk before you'd see some of these things that are happening. Take home message <clears throat> here in Illinois, if you are going, uh, aflatoxin does uh, allow for payment. For damage, but you must take the sample out of the field. If you combine uh, your uh, your your corn grain, and we're talking corn grain now, and then take a sample and have it sent in, they won't pay because that aflatoxin could be happen because how you stored the grain, how what the grain was, how you managed the grain in the bin. So here in Illinois, if you got crop insurance on your on your corn grain, then you want to be sure that you uh, you dot your I's and cross your T's on that one as well. Uh, binders out there, the ones that we're going to look at, we are recommending to our dairymen are going to be the clay-based uh, binders for the aflatoxin. Uh, there are some enzyme products out there that can also be effective. They, they denature the denature the, 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 the ring structure of, of the microtoxin as far as that goes. Uh, we like the yeast cell extracts uh, when you were looking at some of the other microtoxins we saw back about two and a half, three years ago when we had that problem of cold summer, wet summer, just, just directly the opposite as far as that goes. I'll put this up just uh, to, to give you an idea. There's some excellent uh, fact sheets sitting out there, an excellent one from Mississippi. Uh, you can actually ammoniate uh, the contaminated corn grain. And you can do that because you can then feed it to your livestock, especially dairy and beef cattle, because the ammonia breaks down the ring structure of the aflatoxin. That's what some of the enzymes do as well. So you can treat this grain. It has to have some heat on it because you're going to a chemical reaction at this point. You can use ammonia gas, which scares some of us. We had a, a, an accident on our farm back when I was a kid uh, when putting anhydrous on the field and somebody almost died from it. You can also use an aqua or a water ammonia solution. Again, these are the guidelines lines from Mississippi State. The corn will, t will, will, will change in color and it cannot be sold across state lines and it cannot be used for human use for, for a pretty obvious reasons. But if you had some damaged corn out there and you were going to feed it to your livestock on your farm, this might be another alternative to take a look at uh, to, to get this job done, uh, depending where you're on with the, with the aflatoxin. So again, for some of us, we're going to be harvesting corn next two or three weeks. We're going to know this answer at this point. I have not heard from the, uh, any of the, I uh, didn't contact the commercial labs to see what they're seeing. So if anybody has, um, has a uh, uh, experience on new crop, uh, aflatoxin. All we know is that uh, the four or five samples that were called into the plant pathologist uh, were all uh, could not be sold. Could not be sold uh, for for dairy cattle. 
Well, let's start wrapping up here in just a few minutes. We have a few more alternatives to go through here, and, and we'll go a little faster here. Uh, corn stalks and corn uh, and, and straw. One of my big dairy farms, Steve, has bought a thousand big bales. He said, I've got to have something to feed my livestock. I'm going to try to strategically feed these. Again, NRC numbers are coming right at you here. Uh, this is not uh, fancy feed, so trust me, I'd rather have my oat silage in November than corn stalks in November, but here they are. You can see what they look like. Uh, again, uh, fairly high fiber, uh, low energy values at this point. I would expect the NDFs to be low as well and low, low TDN values. So basically, they are high NDF, low NDF digestibility feed, higher in lignin content at this point. If you're going to chop these as uh, harvest them as corn stalks. We expect the nitrate levels will not have changed much because we have not gone through a ferment fermentation as far as that goes. If you're going to ferment these corn stalks, I know, Steve, you've had some dairymen in Wisconsin championing this uh, poach. Uh, they, they, they chop their corn stalks the same day they pick their corn, and mm -hmm. they have enough moisture in them. They can actually ensile those and make them ferment, and then, of course, th that would dissipate some of the nitrate uh, problems, and they probably have a little higher quality feed also because they're going to they're going to get some of the stalks and uh, plants, plant parts and leaves that would sometimes blow away after a while. We say if you're over three pounds of these residues in your lactating ration, uh, careful because I think we're nervous about a fill factor, high levels of NDF and dry matter intakes and rates of passage as far as that goes. Could be a nice window for my dry cows. You all heard Jim directly talk about this on one of the horse dairyman webinars here a couple of months ago. So uh, if you want to go to the high straw diet or a high corn stock diet, this might be the time to do it and take a look at it. Uh, the corn stalks could be carrying lots of dirt. That's another question. How much dirt you're going to be bringing with these corn stalks where the straws tend to be a cleaner product in terms of uh, soil contamination at this point. And you're, in my view, you're going to have to process either one of these. we got to get them down to unsortable lengths, which usually means less than two inches based on the Wisconsin data. And, uh, and so you're going to have to either tub grind or chop or do something to get them into the feeding program. Again, you can ammoniate these products. Uh, and again, we'll probably spend a little bit more time, Steve, in our October webinar talking about the, the next step. Uh, there's some work that's been done uh, at Nebraska, Iowa State, primarily in the beef sector, using the, the calcium oxide. They re rehydrate the corn stalks, put the chemical on, and we go through a chemical reaction. Sodium hydroxide can be used. Ammonium hydroxide could be used as well. And so what we're trying to do here now is to get the fiber more digestible, taking a low-quality roughage, as we'd say, and make it, make it behave a little bit like an, an average quality grass. And so I think we'll, we'll talk more about this in October when we have a little bit better idea on what, what our situations with these other crops look like out there in the feeding program. The winter small grain annuals, uh, we already saw one glimpse of that from the Wisconsin data using winter wheat at this point. Uh, this is another choice where you're going to go to a winter uh, small grain forage as a source. And again, uh, harvesting, uh, the, the data stays the same. Uh, the question is, and I have very little experience with this, Steve. Maybe some of the other people is, but I know they pasture this stuff. You get down Oklahoma and Texas, they will pasture uh, the, these winter uh, cereal grains. Then take the cattle off in November or say in November, December, and then let them come back in spring. And then they'll take the take the, 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 the new growth, take that off either as a grain crop or as a forage crop. So again, this one opens up a couple different windows of simply saying, uh, could we get some type of a harvest this fall, which is going to be fairly immature, fairly high quality, not a lot of scratch factor, and then come back assuming the, 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 the land lets us do that. In other words, uh, some areas got two inches of rain. I don't think you're going to cut a lot of, of uh, winter wheat with two inches of rain uh, tomorrow because of uh, just tearing up the fields and stuff like that. So certainly uh, that that can be another alternative looking at a maybe a small amount of forage, nothing like we were talking about earlier with the small grain forages because you're going to plant them later uh, at this stage again, but you could take them off in the in the fall, in the spring as far as that goes. Uh, this is some data again uh, coming from the University of Wisconsin Extension Service. You can see this is rye forage. I'm not sure that is the small grain of choice there. People like wheat. I'm not sure though uh, with the Hessian fly where this whole thing comes into play at this stage of the game, uh, but uh, th this is the, would be the spring harvest. Now, why do we mention that now, Steve? Well, it means that maybe for some of my dairy producers, they want to put in a winter wheat or winter uh, triticale or something like that because this will come off early in the spring. This will be an earlier crop. 
and or replace some of that missing corn silage. So, you know, uh, one of my good dairymen uh, here in the state of Illinois, he has got a nine-month inventory from carryover. So he's kind of a happy camper in the sense that he's got nine months of good corn silage, and then he's going to blend that with uh, poor quality drought stress corn silage and go to a blend, and uh, he's probably going to have some neat flexibility with his feeding program that some of us don't have. But again, this one would be harvested again in the spring, and you can see a uh, good high in the boot stage, a nice, nice high RFQ value of sitting up in the 180s, and, uh, and you can see proteins in the, in the mid-teens as far as that goes as well. This simply shows how quickly that crop changes, and this would be true for oat silage in the spring or early summer or wheat silage, whatever the case is. You can see uh, the study shows that this stuff really drops. In two weeks, you go from a, a really nice feed with a 150, 160, 170 down to 100. Uh, not to insult our beef people, but we call that beef feed, beef feed as far as that goes. So, Steve, again, another alternative out there as well. The last one is we're going to come back to something we presented back in July, and Jim has updated a little bit for us, and that is pricing drought stress forages, and that question has come up uh, as well. So let's walk through this one, and it uh, looks like we'll be done about a quarter to one, and that's exactly uh, where we are at this stage. And we are getting some comments coming in, and that is really good, really good. So uh, we'll, we'll read those to you, and uh, if there's a question, we'll attempt to answer them or ask you to help me answer some of them as well. Uh, drought stress corn silage forage, basically there are two questions. Uh, number one, if you're going to buy this stuff, uh, here are the things you're going to go through. And in, in the process, and you can see that for some of us, we should be, we should have chopped the silage already because to get it to ferment, we want to be in that 30, 35 percent dry matter window. Now we saw some of that data. Remember, some some of that data was July data, so uh, eyes wide open as far as that goes. And you can see these points. Hopefully, we've a actually answered question one. We've answered question two for you. Uh, we think. Question three will have been, it should, may have been answered already if you did it right and you put the inoculant on it. Uh, number four is a risk. You always got that risk. You know, what, what is this crop going to be? We want our dairymen to buy it on a dry matter base. Dry matter base. And I know nobody wants to do that, but I tell you, uh, it's the only way to go because you've got some really wild, wild cards out there, as T pointed out, with this variable maturity as far as that goes. And then the question is, what else, what else do you have out there? In some cases, in areas in the U.S., it's too late to pull the trigger on some of these other products. Now, there's some sellers here in Illinois. Uh, guys that are going to take the insurance, and again, they have to leave ch check strips out there. So make really, really sure that uh, you, uh, if you got insurance, and 80% of the corn in Illinois is insured, that you make sure that that pay base is covered, and you can take, you can sell the crop. Of course, uh, we've uh, the whole state's been dis uh, di assigned disaster area, so that that also has some ramifications as well at this point. So these are some questions if you're going to buy. We are telling our dairymen to buy it. We think it's, it, it's, it's a crop to have. Uh, here's an assumption that uh, we, we work, you can work it backwards. Uh, you know, the, the old adage, figures never lie, but liars always figure. Here we go. We assume that uh, we're going to get about a half a crop here, maybe a little less than half a crop, two and a half tons of dry matter per acre. Uh, that would be a rough, uh, roughly seven tons as fed at 35% dry matter base. And it had 25 bushels of corn in that. Uh, our, our colleague Dave Fisher down in uh, southern Illinois w did this work for me. He said, what is the value of the fertilizer, the fertility value, does not value organic matter, strictly N, P, and K, and you can see around $40 in round numbers is the, 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 the value of one ton of dry matter. So if you're going to buy this from your neighbor, he certainly is going to want his $40 in fertility because you're going to take that off of them at this stage of the game. Now some farmers want you to take it off because it'll take some of that residue beat down the field and get the field ready for next spring to whatever they're going to plant in there. Here's that same value, and of course that number isn't right. Uh, Jim will probably Google that for me too. Uh, 850 a bushel. Uh, rather than convert all the numbers, I left it alone. 25 bushels of corn out there at 7.5 bushel corn, so that has a value of $187, uh, the, the corn value. Then you uh, take off harvest costs from Dave Fisher here, some trucking costs. Some, in other words, th this is for taking the grain. So you're simply saying that grain is going, that, that, that's going to return to you uh, with those assumed yields about uh, $6 a bushel is what you're going to be paid for that corn and or about $150 per acre. 
Then we come backwards through this, and you, you notice I'm one of those great backward guys uh, working this backwards here. Uh, you, you got your uh, corn uh, there. Uh, we calculated out about seven tenths of a, a ton of corn. You got about uh, you take that off your ton, two and a half tons of, of the dry matter there. You got about one one and a half one point seven tons of corn stalks, and we put that through our calculation. And uh, Steve, we come up with a value here of about uh, $31 a ton at 35% dry matter base to calculate that. That means the farmer got paid for his corn, the farmer got paid for his fertilizer, and you'd end up paying about $31 a ton. Now remember that, uh, re remember that because remember we still have some uh, uh, other costs to take a look at a harvest as well. Uh, we did two things for you. We used FeedVal 2012. Uh, this is a new program that Victor Cabrera's group has come up with here, and you can see all our reference feeds here. We're not going to spend any time on that. We're just going to show you. We put that through that, and then Jim uh, put this together for me. He put and pulled out the feeds. So if you look at this, uh, over here, we've got a, a price, and, and the computer, remember, uses these prices. So it used all those feeds, much like Sesame does. And here is our hay price that we put in our, for, for high quality, this really good stuff. Uh, here's average hay prices over here. You can see that this said it's overpriced by 32%. It said this is only worth $240 a ton. This is worth $230 a ton. My dearman said they can't buy it at that price. Here comes your soybean meal prices coming into play. Over here, I want you to come down. Here's corn silage. Let's go to our corn silage. This computer says worth $96 a ton for corn silage. We price it in at $75. Uh, we price these other ones in at $75.51 and straw at $135 a ton, and they all go green, which says this computer program says all four of those forages are good buys. Now, be careful. I didn't say you should feed this to all, uh, feed this all to, the only thing you're going to feed your high-producing dairy cows. It simply says the nutrients relative to what you saw on the previous slide are good buys. A colleague of mine uh, from Diamond, Diamond V Mills, uh, Mark Tegler, runs a sesame for me. This was in early August. You can see sesame. Uh, uh, here you can see, again, hay is overpriced, very similar to the Wisconsin program. Corn silage, same price there. And then you can see what the corn grain is worth. Now, that will make some of you nervous uh, online. It says corn is underpriced <laughs> in early August, and soybean meal at $360. At $360 a ton is un, is un, is uh, is under is under 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 underpriced as well. So that concludes our our webinar. And uh, basically, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you to kind of uh, bring it out, and then we've got uh, uh, some comments that uh, we can we can visit with. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. You really uh, cover a lot of ground uh, and uh, some very timely messages as as always, and we appreciate it. Great job and. Uh, uh, we uh, appreciate the participation of so many of you out there uh, listening along with us uh, uh, today. This is a good time to mention, as you can see on the screen, that uh, our next uh, webinar will be September 10th, uh, featuring Gordy Jones, who's associated with Central Sands Dairy uh, here in Wisconsin, uh, in a seminar brought to us by Kimmon. He's going to be talking about bringing our management to a higher level, and we're, we're looking forward to hearing Gordy then, and hope you can can be with us. Uh, just uh, while we have a few minutes here, then uh, in uh, October, Mike will be back again, Mike Hutchins, uh, uh, on o October 8th, it'll be the Monday right after Expo, in fact, uh, Zinbro will be the sponsor, and Mike will, I'm sure that you'll be continuing uh, some comments about the feed supply situation at that time, and, uh, and actually we encourage people, uh, not today especially to bring uh, to to enter their questions or comments about uh, what Mike has covered and things that they've been seeing and hearing in their area but also if they have questions that they would like to have Mike cover in the October webinar they can send them to webinars that's plural webinars at hordes.com and uh, we'll get those questions to Mike and he can address them if he has time in October, and I'm sure he'd appreciate hearing from uh, from you all as as we would. So, Mike, I see that we do have a few uh, uh, questions and some comments. You want to uh, now that you've had a chance to catch your breath, you want to take a look at those. 
Sure do, uh, Steve. In fact, I'd like to challenge my listeners. If any of you out there uh, have some experience of taking uh, winter winter small grains, chopping them in late fall, uh, can I do that? Uh, are you saying, uh, I know you can pasture them. I know you can pasture them, but can we harvest them? And, of course, they're going to be soaking wet. But anybody who wants to uh, give me a bit of a, a, a heads up on that, I would certainly welcome that comment as well. Let's go through these relatively fast because I know uh, all of you have busy schedules. Uh, we already kind of touched on can I take uh, can I plant sorghum after maize uh, has been assigned as an alternative, and the answer is maybe you could do that in in Texas, but I wouldn't do it in Illinois or Wisconsin as far as that goes because I don't think I'm going to have enough degree days and, and heat to to grow the crop. Remember, oats small grain likes cool. That's why you plant oats in March and April in Wisconsin and northern Illinois is it likes the cool weather, and we don't want that hot weather. Otherwise, it cuts our yield too much if it's going in for uh, for grain as far as that goes. A comment here it comes in it says farmers in cent uh, in the central sands area of I'm not sure which state that's in uh, uh, said that uh, they had Wisconsin potatoes. Mike you think it's Wisconsin yeah uh, they had potatoes harvested uh, they, they're now uh, they're now not they can now seed one of the uh, winter wheats and irrigate it if needed so. There you go. There you go. So uh, another alternative there. Just watch that Hessian fly because I know we are in trouble until September 15th, September 15th. And that may be the, one of the factors you're going to consider depending on a winter cereal versus a uh, spring cereal, which we talked about a bit earlier. Uh, corn price, somebody uh, entered in a corn is $8 a bushel. And, and so our, some of our calculations are pretty close at that stage of the game and went there. Good question, and I think I, I'll take a guess at this one. It says, is that $38 a day Fisher calculated on drought stress or normal corn? I'm guessing it's on normal corn. I'm guessing it's on normal corn. Uh, any listener, I don't think Dave is online here, uh, but I'm guessing I did see that number at $41 also in one of the, the reference materials we looked at over the weekend, and so I'm pretty sure that's where we're at. Another uh, good question comes in, and, and it relates to your, your, your aflatoxin. What is the risk of using bentonite in sequestering valuable nutrients? And that is a, and that is a good, uh, good point. There is some data saying that uh, sodium bentonite uh, would tie up some of the trace minerals. Uh, and, and so the question is, uh, you know, if I put sodium bentonite in to tie up aflatoxin, and that could be used. That could be used. That's 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 one of the the products that are out there. Could be used uh, in 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 the program. You do have that risk. Uh, looking at some some hierarchy. Uh, one of our grad students years ago looked at that, and it looked like that they they, they bump each other off. And ammonia was probably the 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 the, the, the product of choice. In other words, it would, ammonia would tie to bentonite and tie up uh, that, uh, the, that 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 uh, would provide that that positive ion. If that was true, that'd be the best of both worlds. We'd be glad to do that. But I, I guess my, my point is uh, I have not seen a problem. Maybe some of you online have seen a problem with that. I've not seen a problem because our trace mineral programs using some of the organic trace minerals and our other mineral programs uh, usually uh, have adequate levels if there is some modest tie-up with it. But the point, whoever raised the question, it, it's real. It could be there, and uh, we recognize it and just say make sure you just have a good, a good a trace mineral program, and your organics might have a little bit of advantage at this stage of the game in that area. Another question, which are the best stage moisture for an ensiling, uh, uh, sorghum, uh, f sorghum forage in the autumn? Ah, uh, boy, oh boy, I need help on this one, man. Uh, I need my helpline. I need to call one of my helplines. Anybody online want to try, uh, type in an answer for me at this stage of the game? I think it's, it's headed out. Uh, the forage sorghum, it will have uh, grain on it. The grain is very soft. Otherwise, you're going to see a lot of it coming through. Uh, ran across it uh, you know, on a farm uh, in uh, in southern part of the United States here uh, last year, but uh, I don't dare say much. I'll be in trouble. Steve, do you have any any? No, experience? I don't have anything myself that I can yeah. offer okay. help, Mike. But maybe yeah. somebody will chime in on it for us. So yeah, please. We'll be uh, watching I, for any responses. Yeah, and anybody uh, t type it into us. Jim is patiently waiting here. I, I just don't dare answer it because um, we still uh, are going to have some time for people to respond with uh, comments like that and some other questions. So if anybody has uh, 
something out there they'd like to inquire about, there's still some time to do it, and we encourage you to participate. Yeah, and, and any comments you have, if anybody has got some, uh, if any of you guys got some athletoxin numbers, send them in to us. Uh, we'd be curious on seeing that. Uh, when Steve and I talked about adding this webinar, we we decided we would keep the time short. Some of you have been with us before we <laughs> run run the gamut, as we would say, and we thought it'd be good to just get some comments from from you. And we've gotten several very good ones actually at this point. Uh, another <laughs> question that uh, Jim will answer for us here, and that says, uh, will this presentation be available online for us to view? And I think the answer is yes, but it may be, what, a day or so? Right. I'll try to have it up by um, tomorrow. Okay. So we'll try to uh, let me chime in on that, Mike. Of course, uh, this this webinar and all the previous ones we've had uh, will be available on the Horton Dairyman website and, uh, uh, you know, two or three days from now. So you can go back and, and listen to it again or recommend it to colleagues or go back and pick off some some of the uh, PowerPoints that you want to focus on a little bit more. And uh, so, you know, we've had, uh, as I was telling the folks earlier that tuned in early, over 12,000 people have come back and viewed our uh, archived webinars in the last uh, year and a half or so. And so uh, they're out there and are getting a lot of use, and we encourage you to make uh, use of that as well and share that uh, with your colleagues and coworkers that they can do the same. You bet, Steve. Uh, in fact, we're going to be assigning uh, our students uh, to uh, our, our management level class to go to, to go to a couple of the webinars because the, the data is so 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 fresh, so new, and from the, the experts in the U.S. or Canada, it's a it's a it's a no brainer as far as that goes. Uh, Jim Baltz is, of course, always active with his with his uh, here uh, on the forage one. Let's see. Um, um, uh, no, nobody's bailing me out yet, so uh, you're gonna have to ideally harvest uh, harvest uh, forage sorghum when fully ripe and moisture level uh, below uh, below seven below seventy percent below seventy percent below seventy percent moisture, pretty wet. Uh, this may not occur until after frost. Uh, lodging can be a problem with bad weather. So here comes a hurricane Isaac looking at us at this point. If a, a forage sorghum is contains more than 68 to 70 percent moisture, and start off, we talk about the the seepage and uh, risk from that aspect as well. So it looks like moisture becomes a big factor to playing in here because you got to soften up the. And that's what that farmer told me. The seed heads on the forage sorghum had to be soft, otherwise we're we're going to have are going to have a problem. Uh, comment from North Central Oklahoma: Our corn tested with aflatoxin, um, uh, 400 parts per billion, and it was. It was treated with Alpha Guard. Alpha Guard. Uh, Steve, I have no idea what Alpha Guard is. Maybe he wants to pipe in. No. I, it's, it's a, no. I, I don't. I don't know. Sure. Now remember, the, the the aflatoxin sits in the corn grain, and so if you have some corn grain in your corn silage, that too could be a problem. And then third of all, our discussion came up is if you get buying corn distillers grains made out of corn that had aflatoxin in it, it will concentrate it by a factor of three. So again, as dairy producers, be aware of that. Now, uh, one of our uh, one of our uh, producers. Uh, ethanol said they will buy nothing over five parts per million because they want to be sure they can sell the distiller's grain under 20 because legally they cannot sell that 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 that, that grain across state lines at at 20 parts per million so lots of interesting uh, comments there uh, another question won't nitrates be an issue in fall crops yeah, I think yeah, yeah, you're right. They they could be, especially if you put manure on them. They 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 could have higher levels of nitrates. The good news is, I think most of us are going to take the fall crops as silage. The odds of us making baled hay with two to four drying days in November could be a small challenge uh, here in Illinois. But the 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 the, the listener is right. Nitrates could be an issue. Uh, and especially if you aren't going to ensile it at this, depending on how much nitrogen is on the field, that may be a carryover from um, uh, the, um, the, 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 the corn crop as far as that goes as well. Well, Steve, here's another one for you to answer because I don't have a clue what green grass, uh, lolium. What about using green grass, uh, lolium? L O L I U M, so you can tell I'm not probably even pronouncing it right, uh, uh, be planted on the first week of September. I know nothing about it. I know nothing about it. 
So um, the answer is, uh, if it's a if it's a fast growing grass, and that's the advantage I see with small grains. They'll, they'll come out fast. They'll come out fast. But if, if it's a fast germinating green grass, and you can get some tonnage on it, get some height on it, then I guess, Jim, it could work. But uh, you're on your own. Maybe somebody wants to type in on that and and add a, add a comment as far as that goes. How does direct cut barley compare to corn silage in both quality and quantity? Um, if, 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 it's, if, if it's in the boot stage, we call it poor man's corn silage. In other words, we say it's going to be intermediate between a grass forage and corn silage. So you will have, uh, you'll, you'll have uh, some uh, pretty good energy in it, uh, not as good as corn silage, and you obviously aren't going to have the starch. Uh, content. You might have some sugar in it, but you won't have the starch content. So I think you'll be very happy if you cu if you cut the small grain forages. And this this question was barley. I think you'll be happy with it uh, if you cut it in the in, in the boot stage. Uh, I, but it, it doesn't contain 30% starch. You and I both know that. And of course, the NDF digestibility uh, could should be good. But here we go again. You know, you tell me about the NDF digestibility. And uh, the st and the sugar and the starch content, and we can tell you uh, how competitive it's going to be with corn silage. I, I I don't I don't think you you I don't think you can beat normal corn silage. What about draw stress corn silage? I think I beat the crap out of it. I think I think it'll do well. I think it'll do well. Uh, Affligard uh, is a uh, Sargenta product used in Texas and Oklahoma that is supposed to suppress moles that produce the aflatoxin in corn. And uh, it's a uh, trying to control aflatoxin uh, that direction. And Jim has pulled up a website here from 2012 right. uh, you, well, from someplace. It, uh, <laughs> and uh, I think if you Google it, you should come up. It's a, uh, a specialist, uh, extension specialist, corn soybean specialist. And uh, I'm not sure. Must must be Texas. I'm guessing. Right, Texas. Uh, I don't, rec don't recognize the name at this point. Okay, uh, I think uh, we are uh, out of comments. We're at 1 o'clock. Um, we uh, thank all 70-plus of you that have participated here at this point, and uh, we appreciate you t fitting us into your busy schedule. Uh, Steve, our thanks to Horst Derriman to take a chance. We didn't know if we'd have two people online at this point. Well, we and, nice uh, we uh, just one comment that came in on a different, uh, actually our Facebook page, who said that uh, he's stretching his forage. This is from Minnesota. He's feeding seven pounds of beef pulp uh, to his cows, and they're loving it. And uh, he's paying two fifteen a ton, and he figures that that works out to be about six twelve per bushel of corn. Just a, another comment from somebody that uh, is uh, stretching forage or, or grain supplies uh, this, uh, this fall. Uh, Again, many thanks to you, Mike, for your participation and also to Biotol for their support. And we hope that you all can join us again uh, September 10th. Uh, Gordy Jones from Central Sands Dairy here in Wisconsin is going to be talking about taking our management to a higher level. level. So thanks again for all your participation. Okay. Very good, Steve.